Hello everybody, uh, today we are going to be talking about current, charge, voltage and resistance. Um, so this is basically a kind of review of the stuff that you've done at IGCSE level. Um, so we need to make sure that you are aware of what all these things are uh, and how to calculate them. So we're going to start off with a little definition of what the idea of charge is. Now you kind of came across this uh, a little bit at IGCSE, but we just want to go into a little bit more detail. Now, so, um, all things have an electric charge, as you know. So protons have a positive electric charge, electrons have a negative electric charge, and neutrons have no electric charge. But actually what we're going to see um, in a couple of future lessons, when we look at the nuclear topic, uh, sorry, I've already done that, haven't we? Um, so you've already known that uh, quarks have different charges, so even uh, neutrons are made up of things that have electric charge. Um, now, charge is always measured in coulombs, which has the unit of capital C, um, but it has the symbol of a capital Q. Uh, the reason it has a symbol of a capital Q is because uh, way, way back when they were first discovering a lot of this stuff, um, they thought of charge as, as kind of what it is, as stuff moving around, um, but they called it Q for quantity, so it's a quantity of stuff. Um, so yeah, the symbol is Q. Now, one coulomb is equivalent to the charge that you get on 6.4 times 10 to the 18 electrons. So one useful way of thinking about uh, a coulomb is as a sack of electrons. You can see that I've written it there. Um, so you can imagine that a coulomb is the same amount of charge as you'd get if you got a massive sack and shoved 6.4 times 10 to the 18 electrons into it. Um, that's something that we did quite a lot about uh, at IGCSE. Um, but what we have done a little bit less on is this idea then that if one coulomb is 6.4 times 10 to the 18, uh, then one single electron will have a charge of 1 divided by that. Um, so I could say E, we use the symbol E for the electron charge, um, that is 1 over 6.4 times 10 to the 18. And when you do that, you find the charge of a single electron is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Um, that's also, the, so that's the charge, well I should probably say minus that, shouldn't I, because it is a negative charge. Um, obviously the charge on a uh, proton will be plus 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Um, so do be careful about that. Sometimes they'll ask you for the charge on an electron. If they ask you for the charge on an electron, it's not minus 1 anymore. It is negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. So that's all very well and good. Um, so let's go back more to something that we're familiar with from Key Stage 3, which is current. So the definition that you should be familiar with is that an electrical current is a rate of flow of charge around a circuit. So in uh, mathematical terms, we can say therefore that current is equal to Q divided by T. So a rate of, usually in anything in physics, means per second. Just another little reminder, in case you can't remember from my GCSE, we always use the symbol I for current. And again, a little bit of a history lesson. The reason for that is we used to say that uh, current was the intensity of the quantity of charge. That's where the I and the Q come from. We just haven't changed it because physicists are loath to ever change anything. Um, just to remember of the units then, uh, so we have I is equal to Q divided by T. I is measured in amps, which has a symbol capital A. Q therefore will be measured in coulombs, uh, which is a capital C. And T is obviously measured in seconds. You might notice that I'm uh, writing coulombs with a lowercase key, even a lowercase c, even though it's uh, named after somebody. Again, that's a convention in physics. The name of the unit, even though it's named after a person, always has a lowercase letter, which I think is a little interesting um, factoid. So then again, we're still talking here about uh, IGCSE physics, potential difference. So potential difference is the energy difference that electrons have before and after a component. Um, and when you remember it that way, it suddenly becomes really easy to understand why we hook up uh, measuring devices the way that we do. Um, current, as we remember, 
is the rate of flow of charge through a component. So an ammeter needs to be in series, remember that this idea is in series, so that all the current will flow through it and it can measure that rate of flow of charge. But a voltmeter measures the energy difference before and after something. So my voltmeter needs to be connected up here and here so that it can measure the energy here and the energy here and compare the two. Um, so it is more technically a definition of the energy given to each coulomb or coulomb as I've written there of charge. It is measured in volts, capital V, and it is calculated as potential difference is energy divided by charge. Or we can write it as work done per unit charge. Now, and you can see it's measured in volts, but you could say that a volt is the same as a joule per coulomb, because it's the amount of work, which is energy in joules, divided by an amount of charge which is in coulombs. Now something's going to come a little bit different at CIE, and here's where we start to really start the uh, A-level course, is um, frequently you will see this idea of EMF and potential difference. So potential difference, um, as you should be familiar with it by now, that is the uh, measure of the difference in energy before and after a, that shouldn't be circuit, before and after a component. Electromotive force, on the other hand, is the energy transferred, or we could call it or work done, uh, by a source in driving unit charge around a complete circuit. That's the CIE technically definition. Basically, you can generally think that when we hear the words voltage or potential difference, that's taking energy out of the circuit. So that would be things like resistors, lamps, diodes, anything that gives energy to its surroundings. Electromotive force, or EMF, that is something that is giving energy to the circuit. So potential difference is um, using up energy, electromotive force is giving energy. Um, electromotive force is often represented by this symbol, epsilon. Uh, it's a funny curly E. Don't write a capital E, it's this weird little curly E. Uh, potential difference, on the other hand, is always a V. So both of them, though, are measured in volts. So we have this epsilon uh, here, uh, which is an EMF, measured in volts, and we have a potential difference or a voltage, also measured in volts. So then it's measured exactly the same thing. It's work done per coulomb of charge, but with a potential difference, the coulomb of charge is doing work on something. With electromotive force, the work is being done on the coulomb of charge. So here's one for you to try. Uh, a current of 5 amp flows for 10 seconds. What is the total charge around the circuit? Should be pretty easy for uh, A-level physicists. We say Q is equal to IT. And then I can say, OK, so I want to find Q. So that would be my 5 amps times my 10 seconds, so it is 50 coulombs of charge. Alright, so now we're getting to a bit more hardcore CAE stuff. This is all stuff that you were probably aware of already from uh, IGCSE, but we're just going to formalise this a little bit more. Um, and it's all named after this guy, Kirchhoff, uh, who was a physicist who basically formalised a lot of our understanding of circuits. Um, so it gives a simple way of saying what current and voltage will do in a circuit. And generally speaking, if you ever get a question where you're given a circuit and asked to calculate something about it, you're going to need to use Kirchhoff's laws. So, quite simply, Kirchhoff's first law, it, Kirchhoff's first law says that the current before a branch or node must be equal to the sum of the currents after a branch. So imagine you've got a wire coming here, and then it splits into two separate wires. If I have 5 amps of current going into one branch, and here's my node, so I know that I've got to have 5 amps of current in total coming out. So I might have 3 amps there and 2 amps there, or 2.5 and 2.5, doesn't matter, but the key rule 
is the current before is equal to the total current after. And you could probably use this quite a lot, and if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you think about what current is, we know it's a rate of flow of charge, or to break it down even simpler, it's a rate of flow of electrons. So if I've got a bunch of electrons going into a branch, well, the electrons can't be stored up. Shh, wait for A level before we talk about that. It's not for year 13 before we talk about that. Um, so five amps go in, if I've got five coulombs every second going into something, um, until we deal with capacitors, that can't go anywhere else. So I've got to have uh, five amps or five coulombs a second leaving that point. Um, so it's a relatively simple idea, but it has some quite profound uses. Kirchhoff's second law tells us that around, that around a closed loop, the sum of all the EMFs, if we remember EMFs, that's the voltage or the potential difference work done on charges, so basically it means batteries, or power supplies, or whatever, uh, is equal to some of all the potential differences. So that means basically everything else, everything that uses up energy. So what does that mean? Well, I've got a little circuit here, um, and you can see that if I have a loop of current going through like this, let's talk about the journey of a coulomb of charge. So it is going to have work done on it at the 6 volts, so this is a EMF1. It is then going to do work on the 68 uh, ohm resistor. It is then going to have work done on it at the second battery, and then it is going to do work on this one. Now there's a little bit of a sneaky trick that they've played with you on this particular diagram. Um, you can see that the two batteries are actually facing each other. So can you see this is a positive end, this is a positive end. So what I can say is that the total EMF, that is actually equal to 6.0 volts take away 1.5 volts because they're acting in opposite directions. If I flip this around and make this one bigger, then it will do work the whole way around. And then I can say in my alternative universe, then the total EMF will be equal to 6.0 plus 1.5. Um, maybe that's a bit of a mean question for me to start with, but oh well, you'd get to do with it. Um, so what can we do with this knowledge? Well, uh, this means that we can do some pretty useful stuff. Um, so I can say then, all right, well, what is the voltage across my resistor? So across these two resistors. Well, I know that the total EMF. Oops. Go back to the right slide. Yes, that does mean that you're nearly there in case you're panicking at home. Uh, I know that the total EMF will be. Uh, 4.5 volts, so I know that the voltage across uh, the 68 to 1, which I'm going to call V1, plus the voltage across the 12 ohm will be equal to 4.5 volts. Um, I just now need to work out how it's split between the two of them, and I can do some really useful stuff. Now, I'm not going to go into that now because that's actually the subject of our next video. Alright, so a little summary of what you should know by now. Um, we've talked about how charge, that is the fundamental property of how electrically positive or negative something is. We've talked about current, that is the rate of flow of charge, or Q is equal to IT. Uh, we've talked about voltage or potential difference, that is the energy difference per coulomb of charge before and after a point. Um, so we can say that voltage is equal to work done divided by charge. Curtis' first law says that the sum of the currents at a node equals the sum of the currents after a node. So if I have uh, 3 amps going in, oops, and split into 2, then I might have 1 amp here and 2 amps there. Or if I have, and then they can recombine, but when they recombine, I've got to have 3 amps again. And then Kirchhoff's second law says that the sum of the EMFs around a closed loop equals the sum of the voltages around the same loop. So if I have a uh, battery here, and that is a 6 volt battery, and I've got a resistor here, then I know that this must have 6 volts across that resistor. It also tells me, remember this thing where it says here, a closed loop? 
Well, that's actually quite interesting, because what that says is, here is a closed loop. Yeah, it goes from the battery, through the resistor, and back to the start again. Well, what about if I add on a second resistor? Well, I've now formed a second closed loop. That loop now goes that way. But if I'm following that loop, it goes from the battery, down here, straight back to this resistor, and then back to here again. So that tells me that this resistor also receives 5 volts. And again, that kind of makes sense from a logical perspective, because we're saying work is the amount of energy, or sorry, uh, voltage is the amount of work done for every coulomb of charge. Well, there's no opportunity elsewhere along this loop for those coulombs of charge to do work, because they've only come from the battery to there. So again, um, Kirchhoff's laws are kind of obvious once you start to really think about what electricity is, um, but it's quite a profound and important way, and if you can just hold those in your head, a lot of these problems become a lot simpler. But that was a really quick introduction to some of the stuff that should be kind of familiar to you from IGCSE. The next video, we're going to go into resistance in a lot more detail, and that's going to equip you to start doing some of the much more tricky problems uh, that we come across at IGCSE, sorry, at A-level. But of course, I'm hoping that roll of thunder, you have got that on the video and that wasn't a, a portent of uh, what the lessons are going to be like in the future. But uh, if you do have any questions, please, as always, chat to me, yeah, in our list. Thanks very much for watching.